Uh, I can tell you, as someone who is in women's studies and has been in women's studies for 20 years, that you're probably one of the few women's studies programs in this country that has, uh, supports an abolitionist approach. Uh, it, I can, it is often very lonely uh, in universities having the kind of uh, perspective that we have. Okay. So, and I, I want to talk about this as a good lead-in, as, as being a, a women's rights movement of the 21st century that recognizes the harm to women and girls in the sex industry. This is a broad-based movement. Uh, it is made up of uh, our broad-based coalition that has worked for the trafficking laws in the United States, the, the TVPAs, uh, is made up of feminists, of liberals, of conservatives, of secular groups, of faith, and of faith-based groups. And I want to tell you that the Christian community is one of the most unifying voices opposing sex trafficking today. Uh, and it is your values and the uh, the recognition of the importance of dignity uh, of women and girls uh, that uh, informs your opinion and makes you such a good ally. So I want to thank you and I hope you understand that you uh, as a community are the, really one of the prime leaders uh, of the anti-sex trafficking movement. What this movement is doing Uh, and that is, it is transforming the perception of women and girls in prostitution. Uh, we've uh, heard that this morning, uh, that women are often victims, that they are even enslaved, and that they need services and support, and they need compassion uh, and justice. And that is really having a transformative effect uh, throughout the United States and throughout the world. We're really just at the beginning of this movement, uh, but uh, I am convinced that it is growing. The, the number of people attending this conference is an indication of that, and I am convinced that we are going to transform uh, women's lives in the world. Okay, uh, just to give you how my understanding of this, uh, of the sex trade of women and girls, I believe it is based on a supply and a demand uh, from sending and receiving countries, regions, and cities uh, around the world. And that this supply of victims uh, is made possible by, well, by the easy recruitment of women and girls. Okay, the uh, easy recruitment of women and girls is made possible by poverty by unemployment, uh, by lack of a promising future, uh, by, for women that are eager for a Western lifestyle or eager for a better lifestyle, uh, and obligation of families. Uh, many women and girls think they're going to get a job in order to help their, their, their families. And for love and security. Uh, we've heard uh, from a testimony of survivors about the importance of uh, needing emotional support and uh, what they often have to sacrifice in order to try to get some of that. And these are all things that then uh, make uh, women and girls vulnerable to traffickers. But I think it's really important to focus on the demand side. Um, because this is where the sex trafficking process begins. Uh, in the receiving destination countries, regions, and cities. And this demand for victims is created by legal and tolerated sex industries and by prostitution. That is the driving force of sex trafficking. And we know that pimps go out to recruit victims into the sex industry. Victims don't come forward knocking on the doors of brothels and saying, can I come in and work here? They are recruited. And that means that there is a demand that is out there looking for victims. And we need to understand that. OK, what is there a demand for? There's a demand for young women and girls. There's a demand for exotic women, uh, as we just heard in, uh, in the last presentation. And exotic can be de defined by a, a, a being a different race, ethnicity, skin color, nationality. All of those things are exoticized uh, by the pimps and the johns. Uh, and the man thinks, I want, to, I want to try that kind of a woman. Uh, and 
Women are often sought because they speak the same language as the men, so that they are trafficked into migrant communities or uh, certain communities and cities uh, to service those men uh, because they want women that speak the same language as they do. The turnover of victims is high. Uh, and therefore a steady demand of victims is needed. And I'm going to go through a little bit about why there's this steady demand for victims that's needed. Vim victims have a limited useful life. Uh, these are arrest uh, photographs from a woman in, in Florida. Uh, I got them from an article that actually had a good outcome, uh, that she got into a program uh, that enabled her to get out of prostitution. But nonetheless, this is the change in a woman in four years. Uh, as a result of uh, being in prostitution and, and probably taking drugs. Uh, and so women that are being used so horribly have a limited useful life. Uh, and if it isn't physical deterioration, it's emotional deterioration until they can't cope. Uh, one of the things that uh, my, people, my women I know that work in Russia uh, tell me is that after a, a woman gets used up in uh, Western Europe, um, and often that means that they simply have emotional breakdowns till they're no longer of any value to the brothels. They buy them a bus ticket home. So they send them home, but it's after they have been uh, used up. Victims are murdered. Uh, we heard that in the last testimony. Uh, this is a pic picture of uh, Tiffany uh, from San Francisco. First picture of her when she was a child. Later one, a picture of her with a pimp. Uh, this pimp sold her to Hajan, who murdered her and discarded her. If this pimp wasn't arrested and put in jail, he went out and recruited another young woman. So we have to remember what happens to the victims, and if the perpetrators aren't stopped, they just go recruit more. Victims are deported. This is a picture of a group of women who've been... Uh, Nigerian women who've been deported from Italy. Uh, and you, as you can see, they've actually been taken off a plane outside the airport and, and put into a, uh, sitting on the ground together where everyone can gather around them and stare at them uh, and know who they are. Uh, a few years ago, uh, when women from Nigeria returned from abroad if they had been arrested in a, in a uh, prostitution raid. They uh, forcibly tested them for HIV and made the findings public. Uh, this is horrible in and of itself of what's happening to these women, but if the Italian police did not take down that brothel, did not take down that trafficking ring, if all they did was raid it and deport the women, the trafficking ring came back and recruited another. 16, 18 women to take them back to Italy. Victims die uh, from injuries, from disease, uh, from HIV, AIDS. Uh, they commit suicide. Uh, many, we know that uh, many women who've been in prostitution, a uh, very high proportion of them think about suicide. And in some studies, uh, women who've been in prostitution, about 50% will at least attempt suicide. Uh, and one, the only known longitudinal study done was here in the United States in Colorado, and they looked at the mortality rate for women in prostitution and found that in the United States, uh, it's six, for women in prostitution, it's six times that of the persons of similar age and race. Six times the mortality rate. And victims are rescued, they escape, or they're... Um, uh, are rescued, they escape, or arrested in raids. Now, you usually think that, well, that's good. A victim have escaped. That's wonderful. And of course it is for that particular victim. But if no one follows up and goes back and, and, and shuts down that brothel, the pimps go out and recruit more victims to replace them. So these are, the, these are just some of the ideas or the, the uh, reasons that, that there's always this ongoing recruitment of victims. Okay, the demand factors. The number one demand factor for women and, and girls and for prostitution and sex trafficking are the men who purchase the sex acts. They're usually faceless and nameless. We, we, we don't even have much idea about who they are. 
And when anyone says we're going to talk about prostitution or we're going to talk about sex trafficking, they think, oh, we're going to talk about victims. We're going to talk about women. And sometimes they even forget that, about the men which are creating the demand. And yet they are the ultimate consumers of the trafficked women and children. And you know that there are probably lots of debates about whether women choose to, to be in prostitution, whether they can choose to be uh, in prostitution, whether it's a meaningful consent. I mean, the arguments sort of go on and on and on. But one thing I think it's, we can pretty much agree on, and that is men make a choice to buy sex. The only exception I can think of is, is we heard earlier where a father takes a 14-year-old son to a brothel. And we know that men sexually assault, batter, humiliate, and degrade women when they buy them for sex acts. Uh, how many of, the, of those Johns uh, use violence, extreme violence, uh, we really don't know. But men who buy uh, women in for sex acts are seeking power and control, just the way that batterers do uh, in domestic violence. And this is what uh, someone uh, who works with, uh, has a John school, works with men, uh, said, some, some people, of course he's meaning men, do not want real relationships, or they feel entitled to something beyond the real relationships they have. Some people do not uh, want an equal sharing relationship. They do not want to be nice. They do not want to ask. They like the power involved in buying a human being who can be made to do almost anything. And that's what it is about for someone to go and buy sex. It also has to do with not wanting any kind of relationship responsibility. They want zero responsibility or accountability involved in buying sex acts. Okay, other demand factors. The pimps and the sex traffickers. They're the traffickers, the pimps, the brothel owners, the mafia members, the corrupt officials, the support services, such as the hotels and the taxi drivers that we heard about, that there are, are entire services of taxi drivers, uh, internet service providers. These are all people uh, that either directly or indirectly benefit from the prostitution and trafficking of women and girls. Uh, and their goal is to make money by sexually exploiting the victims. That's what they're in this for, is they're in it for the money. Okay, these are just a few uh, statistics from one study uh, that I did uh, that interviewed women in prostitution, some of, of whom would have been identified as victims of trafficking, uh, some would not. And it talked about the pimps and coercion that they were subjected to. And we found that 86% of women were physically abused by pimps, and 50% of them were assaulted frequently or daily. So this isn't something that you get up beat up once or twice. This can be an, a, a daily occurrence. 64% of the women had weapons used against them. 80% of the women were sexually assaulted by the pimps. 34% of the women had death threats to them or their families. 85% of the women were psychologically abused by the pimps. 90% of the women were verbally threatened by pimps. 71% of the women had pimps use drugs to control them. And 52% of the women uh, were forcibly returned, stalked, physically abused, and threatened when they tried to leave. Now you see that some of those things are underlined in red. If we use the TVPA definition of sex trafficking, a severe form of tra sex trafficking, all of those things underlined in red would have met the legal definition of sex trafficking. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Okay, these are some pictures, uh, some from police, some uh, that I've taken, of tattoos uh, that are on women. One of the things that uh, the, the pimps in the United States do to U.S. citizen victims is they get them tattooed. These are marks of ownership. If you think this isn't about a modern-day slave trade, look at the tattoos. The pimps have their names tattooed on the women. 
Uh, this particular pimp's street name was King Tay. It's tattooed on her thigh. I mean, this, these are real tattoos, too. This isn't, these aren't the temporary kind. This one says, uh, one and only, Lalo. Uh, Lalo was the pimp's street name. This one is a um, uh, calf of another woman with the pimp's name, Lalo. And the other uh, side of the calf of the other woman, that says, uh, property of Lalo. And they literally tattooed with marks of ownership. And some of the people running the uh, shelters for women in prostitution in the United States tell me that they're now seeing 80 to 90 percent of the young women coming in having these kind of tattoos on them. So you can ask all the questions about why women don't leave, why can't they get away, and we can talk a lot about violence and force and uh, confining women. But what do you do when you actually have that kind of a mark of ownership on you? This is a picture I took of the back of a young woman's neck. Uh, in the um, slang terminology of prostitution, a pimp tells the women to refer to him as their daddy. He is the daddy of the fa family or daddy of the stable. Uh, and this young, wo this young woman has this tattoo that she's daddy's little bitch. This is a um, picture that I, I got from a news story just a couple of weeks ago. And it's a picture of a 16-year-old girl getting her pimp's name tattooed on her arm. And she had met the pimp less than three weeks ago. So it only takes just a few weeks being controlled by a pimp, and already they're being branded and marked. Uh, the, everything I showed you here are tattoos, which is the most common form of marks of ownership. Uh, but there are also uh, brand, literally brands uh, with hot irons or with uh, hot instruments. And uh, frequently the brands are like the pimp's initials or something right over the woman's breast. The, that will be a place where there's brands. Uh, and in some cases, particularly uh, with certain uh, immigrant women, women, they'll use scarification, uh, the, the scratching of the skin, and then adding caustic material so that it uh, builds up uh, a scar. Uh, the tattoos are more common. Incidentally, the, the uh, tattoos, the pictures of the tattoos from Lalo. Lalo was arrested by the Phoenix uh, Police Department and one of the charges against him was aggravated assault for having those women tattooed. So you can think, when you think about how are we going to get these guys, uh, how are we going to uh, uh, get charges against them so that they stick, uh, think about that, aggravated assault for the tattoos or the brands. Okay, another important factor in the demand are the state and the government. The, by the state, um, uh, I mean the country. Because by tolerating or legalizing prostitution, the state helps create a demand for victims. Uh, when, the, when the town council decides that doing something about prostitution is a low priority, what they are saying is it's okay to bring women into this town to do that to them. It's, it's okay that the men of this community go out to the massage parlors and use the women. And when you legalize it, as they do have in uh, the Netherlands uh, and Germany and uh, in parts of Australia and, the, and New Zealand, what they're saying is it's okay to bring women into this country to use them for prostitution. And that's what's happened in the Netherlands. About 90% of the women in prostitution in the Netherlands are not citizens, of, are not Dutch. They're not even from the European Union. Although, actually, now the European Union has, has uh, taken in countries from the Eastern Europe, like Poland and the Czech Republic. They may, may be more likely from that. But they're not, the point is they're not Dutch women. These are all women that have been recruited from someplace else. 
and brought in to be used either by the Dutchmen or by the tourists. Uh, because Amsterdam is a, uh, and other cities in, in the Netherlands are sex tourist destinations. A sex tourist is someone who travels for the purpose of having sex. So that's what the, the government does, and that's how the government actually facilitates or allows uh, the sex trafficking uh, and prostitution of women and girls. We know that in the counties in Nevada, uh, prostitution is legal, and indoors in Rhode Island, where I live, prostitution is decriminalized. That means it's not even legalized. There are not even any, any regulations on it. It's simply there's no law at all concerning prostitution. I was describing to this to someone um, in the Department of Justice recently, and he said, so it's like the wild, wild west. I said, yeah, that means, that's right, no law at all. And it's almost, and what I'm finding is it's almost impossible to get the police to be able to go in there because there are no laws. And there are tolerant cities such as Las Vegas and Atlanta, cities where there are large, that are large convention destinations, uh, or that there's going to be a large number of single men, or at least single for the weekend, the, the, for the time of the convention, uh, coming in. And cities even develop strategies to protect their sex industries, such as Las Vegas, you know, uh, what happens here stays here? What kind of a message is that? And uh, I, I have to tell this story. Uh, is someone keeping track of time? Someone sort of give me a heads up. Um, I was listening to a presentation by a vice cop from Las Vegas. And he was telling me about the women that they, some of the women that they were arresting. And they really exclusively target the women, and the pimps if they're, if they're pimping minors. Um, but that's about it. They really are looking out to protect the Johns. And they, he was talking about some of the women that they, protect, that they arrest that are uh, stealing wallets from the men, that they're slipping the men uh, drugs uh, in order to knock them out long enough to steal their wallets. Now, I admit this is not OK. This is a crime. And certainly they are putting men's risks, even at li or, uh, lives at risk, by giving them uh, drugs to knock them out. But nonetheless, you know, they weren't arresting these men. They were only arresting the women. And I, I asked some questions, and he said, well, the, generally the women that are doing that um, are controlled by the most vicious pimps in Las Vegas. Matter of fact, they're so, the, the reason that the women are, ste going, are stealing the wallets is because they have such a high quota each night. They have to make so much money each night, they can't have enough sex acts to raise that much money, to get that much money. So they have to start stealing money in order to meet their quotas. And I saw, you know, I'm sitting there going, well, why don't you arrest the pimps then? And he said, eh, the women won't testify against them. That was it. So they even know how, how controlled the women are, uh, and their main goal is just to protect the men so to make sure the men are safe there. That's what I mean about uh, protecting the sex industry. And in this case, protecting the Johns. Okay, the culture. Uh, the culture, mass media, plays a role in normalizing prostitution, um, particularly pimps. We've had uh, some references to this before. How many have heard of a pimp and hoe party? I won't ask how many people have gone to a pimp and hoe party, uh, but this is all about normalizing uh, pimping, normalizing uh, prostitution. One of the really good things that has been, that has made the anti-sex trafficking movement so successful so far is that we have adopted a human rights approach uh, to uh, combating trafficking. Uh, it's called the victim-centered approach. And uh, what this has done is that it has taught us to see the women as victims, how they are hurt. We have set up uh, a lot of systems, like a T visa uh, and services for victims, uh, counseling, so that they are able 
to uh, turn their lives around so that they're able to get out of the brothels and get some assistance. Uh, there's not nearly enough of these services available uh, as need to be. There really aren't enough services for U.S. citizen victims as there are for, for foreign victims. But nonetheless, this is a, a good approach to victims. But one of the things I have seen over the last few years, and that is that there are some drawbacks to the victim-centered approach. Uh, and that is that we also have victim-centered prosecutions. It really is up to the woman to testify against the pimp if you want to get a, or a sex trafficker if you want to get a conviction. And it's the, and it's the victim's behavior that's judged. In other words, is she a real victim? Because the first thing that the, the, the police go in and do a raid, they have to interview the victim to determine, is she a real victim? Is she willing to testify? Is she willing to cooperate with the police? Therefore, she's the first one that's being judged. And many, as we know, many victims are reluctant to testify against the perpetrators for very good reasons. Uh, they are extremely vicious. They often have control or access to the victim's family at home, including their children. So there are a lot of good reasons why victims are reluctant to testify. But because of the way we've written the law, if you don't have a victim testimony, you don't have a case. So that's how we have, in my opinion, mistakenly made prosecutions victim-centered as well. And it has been uh, my goal, working with uh, our national coalition over the last few years, to try to find ways to change that. And to do that, I think we need to uh, add a perpetrator-focused approach to the victim-centered approach. Okay, very clearly, I hope you can read this, oh, it's still pretty light, um, is it do not abandon the human rights approach. Do not ab uh, abandon the victim-centered approach to victims. But we really need to add this perpetrator-focused approach uh, in order to focus more of our attention and to uh, reform our laws so that we really are targeting the perpetrator's behavior. We need to focus on judging the perpetrator's activities not just the, the victim behavior. We need to develop strategies to investigate and prosecute the perpetrators that go beyond just needing the victim testimony. Because we need to take the burden off the, the victim and stop judging the victim. Okay, I wanna just go through briefly this uh, perpetrator-focused approach by the demand factors. First of all, we have to make men accountable for their behavior. It, you know, there's sort of going to be two take-home messages from my talk. This is number one. We have to start making the men accountable. And there's lots of information out there. There was just a, a raid in Houston earlier this week uh, in which they said the, they found records this was supposed to be a, quote, high-class escort service. The escort service did background checks on the men before they would allow them to uh, buy sex from the women. I'm sure that they paid with credit cards. This is an enormous data set. They can identify every single one of those men with good, hard evidence. And yes, there's already been, you know, Stuff in the news about, well, there's some important businessmen. There might be some politicians. There might even be some police listed in there. Well, that's one of the things right now why we keep letting men off. is because important men are in those databases. And I have got to the point, well, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. I'm really tired of seeing men, uh, uh, like a senator recently, stand up and say, oh, I sinned, but it's really a private ma matter between myself and my family. No, it wasn't. It wasn't private. He was out in a brothel. 
This wasn't private behavior. Uh, and so we, we, like I said, okay, number one take home medicine, meshes. We've got to start making the men accountable. And we have to start stigmatizing the buying of sex acts. We have to start, stop saying, oh, he must have been lonely. Oh, his wife doesn't take care of him well enough. Uh, all the ways that we have of, of sort of making excuses for the men. Time's up. And I'd like to point out that we have done this with other things, like drunk driving, domestic violence, smoking. Think about how we've changed the culture and stigmatized those behaviors over the last 20 years. So it is possible. We need to arrest the men for breaking the law, as simple as that. And we need to charge men who buy sex acts from minors with felony crimes, like child sexual abuse, sexual assault of a minor, statutory rape. If this was a man who was a teacher and had sex with a student, if this was a man who was a Boy Scout leader and had sex with a child, if this was a neighbor that molested a, 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 a neighbor's girl, there were, there's, all, there's zero tolerance for that anymore. But if a man drives across town and pays $100, he can get away with abusing a child. We have to have, uh, call an end to that. OK, another thing, this is another of uh, the take home messages. And that is, we have to start talking about sex trafficking crimes, plural. OK? Uh, and we need to talk about all trafficking and pimping related offenses in the discussions of trafficking. We have to move beyond the narrow definition of a severe form of trafficking in the TVPA. Right now, the entire sex trafficking movement, sex trafficking is defined by the hardest to use law in the United States. Why is it we have chosen to use and talk about and define our movement based on what is the hardest law to prove in the country, at least around, I mean, on sex trafficking. So we need to talk about sex trafficking crimes, plural, move beyond this narrow definition of the t in the TVPA, and broaden the definition of sex trafficking beyond just uh, slavery. Because one of the things that Brad Miles did this morning, he talked about the, the derivations of the laws and how they were all under penage and slavery. Um, well, this goes into the whole legal history, too, that I don't have time to, to uh, go into. But because they put the sex trafficking laws under that slavery and peonage statute, uh, or, or co uh, uh, category in the code and in the criminal code, then we only talk about the slavery statutes. There are other, other ones, and I'm going to talk about them. Okay, I think we've pretty much got the message that pimping is sex trafficking. Uh, we've heard people using the terms interchangeably now, um, and uh, don't don't uh, we're not just being sloppy. Uh, sex trafficking is pimping, and pimping is sex trafficking. And historically, society understood the harm of pimping and the crimes involved. If you go back and start looking at the origin of your anti-pimping laws in most states, they go back 100, 200 years. They're old laws. They're often written in old language as well. But one of the things that the sex trafficking movement did is uh, when it sort of built up steam and then moved to passing the TVPA in 2000, was that it forgot about the anti-pimping laws. It thought they were doing something new. And they reinvented the wheel. And frankly, the wheel they invented wasn't, good, wasn't as good as the laws that were already on the books. So we have to backtrack and make some corrections. We already have federal laws against pimping. The Mann Act is one of them. Uh, and I'm not going to uh, go in to read this detail uh, or word by word. But what it means is if you transport someone across a state line for the purposes of prostitution, it's a federal felony. You don't need to use force or fraud or coercion. It doesn't have to be slavery. And think, all you do is if you take someone across a state line, 
for prostitution, it's a federal crime. How many have ever heard of the Mann Act? Few of you? Good. But it's a whole lot easier to prosecute a violation of the Mann Act than it is the TVPA. Here's another one, alien smuggling for prostitution. This has been around since about 1865. If you import or attempt to import anyone into the United States for the purposes of prostitution, it's a federal felony. That's simple. No force, no fraud, no coercion, no heavy duty victim testimony about everything that happened to them and was done to them. You import someone into this country or even attempt to import someone into this country for prostitution, it's a federal crime. And, I can sit, and, and U.S. attorneys are charging traffickers with man act and alien smuggling for prostitution charges. They are using these laws. But the problem is, is somehow the movement, the anti-sex trafficking movement, doesn't know about them and isn't talking about them. And it's got to the point, and, and I'll, I'll tell you, I've done this myself, where the next time, every time I see a definition of sex trafficking anymore, it's always the hardest law to prove. I've done it myself. But from now on, I will talk about sex trafficking crimes, plural, and I will talk about all the kinds, all the federal felonies, not just the one that's the hardest to prove and the one that, that makes, puts the heaviest burden on the victim. So that's, that's the number two take-home message. <laughs> okay, we need to investigate, arrest, and prosecute traffickers and pimps and their associates. I mean, that, that's just sort of... Uh, uh, an obvious one, and we need to use federal, state, and local law enforcement. There's, there's laws against prostitution, pimping, trafficking at almost all those levels. One of the things that, uh, a serious mistake that has been made, and that is there has been a whole movement to get state level anti-trafficking laws. To my knowledge, every single one of them follows the TVPA ver definition, which is the hardest law to prove. So we now have about 38 states that have passed laws that are almost impossible to use. So we have got a, we've got more work to do. What, five minutes? OK. OK, we need to permanently shut down the brothels, whatever names they go by, it's obvious. Enforce exa existing anti-pimping laws. You need to revise your state anti-pimping laws to make the offenses felonies, to increase the penalties in which you judge the perpetrator's behavior, not the victim's, and pass easily enforceable state anti-trafficking laws. That's what I was just getting at. The laws that have been passed are too hard to use, and that's why we only have about three state-level anti-trafficking uh, cases. Zero tolerance for glamorizing, romanticizing, pimping, and prostitution. This is the cultural change that goes after the uh, demand that's created by the culture. Uh, we have now have zero tolerance for racist, ethnic-based jokes or rape jokes. When I was growing up, I heard, I heard, I heard uh, uh, race-based jokes. I heard rape jokes. They're not funny anymore. People don't tell them. We need to do the same thing around jokes about pimps. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the William Wilberforce Victims uh, Protection Reauthorization Act. Uh, talked about the broad-based uh, movement. It was passed into law in December last year, and it makes it easier to prosecute pimps and sex traffickers by reducing the burden on the victim to testify. This, uh, we've already started working on this perpetrator-focused approach. Um, let me see, is this going to come up? Okay. As I said, easier to prosecute sex traffickers of minors. Uh, prior to this law, you, uh, a prosecutor had to prove that the, per that the trafficker knew that the, mo that the victim was under age 18. No more. Now, you don't. if he traffics someone that's under age 18, he's guilty. He doesn't have to, to, you don't have to prove that he knew she was under 15. We now have something called the victim's perspective. And that is force, fraud, and coercion, when they are, do have to be proven, will now be gauged through the victim's point of view. What a big difference that's going to make in legitimizing the victim's story. 
how she saw it and why she thought she was trapped. The third is, or the next thing is preying on the victim's drug use or addiction. We know that about 90% of women in prostitution use drugs and alcohol uh, on a daily basis. Now, uh, if the trafficker knew that the victim was using drugs or alcohol on a daily basis, that will be considered a form of nonviolent and psychological co coercion. So no longer will they be able to prey on victims by, in, by controlling them uh, through their addictions. Okay, the alien harboring for prostitution, sentences will be increased for harboring, harboring an Ill, illegal immigrant for purposes of prostitution. Once again, no, force, no proof of force, fraud, or coercion is going to be required. You harbor someone for the purposes of prostitution, uh, we're going to increase the sentences. Also, the brothel landlords, they're going to be, start held, be held accountable. Uh, if a brothel landlord recklessly disregards that a minor is being used for prostitution on the premises, there's going to be a mandatory minimum sentence of 10 to 15 years. And no proof of force, fraud, or coercion is required. That's tough. Okay, and then from the international level, one of the things that we've done is we've come up with a demand standard. And that from this year's TIP report on, and they started it last year, but it wasn't featured, countries will be evaluated on whether they're making serious and sustained efforts to reduce the demand for commercial sex acts. Think about that. Next year's, this, the TIP reports from now on, are going to rate countries, not whether they're just combating trafficking, not whether they've done anything to reduce the demand for trafficking victims, but whether they've done anything to reduce the demand for commercial sex acts. If we can get someone in the, to head the trafficking office and get the administration to say, we're going to actually enforce the laws that we have, we can make enormous progress, not only here, but, in the, but uh, all over the world. Okay, so just to wrap up, we need a comprehensive approach to trafficking, the victim-centered approach, but also the perpetrator-focused approach as well. And just to re-emphasize uh, re that this is really a growing global human rights movement against sex trafficking and pimping uh, in all forms of sexual exploitation. Uh, I think it's the human rights movement of our time. I also think it's the women's rights, human, uh, women's rights movement of our time. And I just want to congratulate all of you for, for being part of it. Okay. Um, Dr. Hughes, um, thank you for your you know, presentation. I did have a question about, you spoke about um, basically the state being complicit in you know, creating this demand because of the law. Because yes prostitution, you know, can be legalized. And I've actually been to, um, been to Germany where prostitution is, is legal. Mm -hmm. And my question is, um, what would you say to the argument that legalized prostitution sort of brings this dark secret to light, which is sort of driven underground um, in many, in many mm -hmm. cultures and societies, mm -hmm. and it sort of gives these women legal rights, which they otherwise mm -hmm. wouldn't have. And... <coughs> Um, decriminalizes, um, you know, the act of sex work such that they're not um, ostracized and pushed out of society mm -hmm. as outcasts. Um, I just feel like there's a possibility that when brothels are legalized, there's a standard, um, it's more open, and there's more checks and balances as to what goes mm -hmm. on. Okay, um, I strongly disagree. Uh, one of the things that is happening in the Netherlands uh, is they have they legalized brothels in the year 19, in 1999. Uh, in the last two years, they have moved to shut down the windows in Amsterdam. Over half of the windows are now shut down, permanently closed, because what they found was that legalized prostitution became a magnet for organized crime, trafficking, and money laundering. Uh, it, did not, it, it did not create this uh, utopian world in which there was going to be rule of law and women would get services. There have been a number of prostitutes uh, unions formed in both uh, 
um, Germany and the Netherlands. They have almost no membership uh, because the women often consider themselves, those that are free to, to join, which is not the vast majority of them, uh, found that I'm, they think I'm only here for a year or so to make money and hopefully be able to go back home. I don't want a permanent record that I was a prostitute. So it in no way has uh, ended stigmatization. Uh, also, I don't believe that it has brought anything to light. Uh, there is still just as much organized crime. Uh, I was in Amsterdam recently, and uh, someone from Interpol told me, look out for the pimps. And so when most people go down and they look in the windows staring at the women, they, I turned around and looked the other way. And what you saw on the, on the corners was you saw men with cell phones watching and controlling, counting how many men went into those windows so that they would know how much money to collect from those women uh, in the evening. And what was amazing to me was how quickly they saw that I noticed them. And they became extremely nervous when they realized that I knew that they were there. So it is just as pimp-controlled as it is anywhere else, even though it is, quote, legal. I was wondering, you, you deal mainly with the sex trafficking, not just, the, just in human trafficking in, in general. I, my younger daughter was telling me that um, the greatest import here to America is actually Russian women. And I was wondering how much of that, I know a lot of them are marrying American men. I wonder how much prostitution is actually women who marry men. I know that locally here, that there were some spas that were shut down and women were accused of uh, prostitution. And they were women, Oriental women, with American mm -hmm. last names. Yes. And I was wondering well, how we, that? I think that the, the, uh, from research that's been done, and we need a lot more, uh, the largest group of women trafficked into the United States uh, for prostitution uh, is from Mexico, Central America. Um, that makes sense of the closest. The next largest group are Asian, and then uh, Eastern European are about third. Uh, so they're not the largest group. Uh, we know that before smuggling, uh, across borders used to be so easy. Uh, one of the ways that pimps would get uh, women into, uh, particularly Korean women, into the United States was to have them marry American servicemen in the military in Korea, bring them over here, and then quickly divorce them and turn the woman over to the massage parlor. Uh, I don't know. I don't think that's happening nearly as much as it used to be. Uh, how much of the sort of mail order bride industry is connected to, the, to sex trafficking? I'm sure some of it is. How much? We don't know. Uh, my question is actually about polygamy as a form of sex trafficking and not speaking exclusively of the Mormon, fundamentalist Mormon enclaves, but also the people who are coming in as immigrants and practicing that here. Mm -hmm. Are any of the groups that you're associated with working on that? Because there is definitely an element that is very mm -hmm. similar, even though some of the motivations yeah. are different to sex trafficking. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I personally uh, oppose polygamy uh, in, in any of its forms, but sex trafficking is defined as involving a commercial sex act. Okay, there's sort of nothing commercial in polygamy uh, unless you have evidence in, in which you find that the girls are actually sold. If they're actually sold, then that would become uh, a, a, a form of trafficking. Uh, but, we dis but the law distinguishes be between uh, any kind of sexual abuse and a commercial sex act. Hi, Dr. Hughes. My name is Michael Mill, and I'm a junior WS major here. And um, you mentioned earlier about trying to hold men accountable and attempting to stigmatize the purchase of sex. But in recent decades, in an American culture where it's extremely hypersexualized, where everywhere we turn, sex is sold either through mass media or advertisements, and women's body image is constantly being manipulated, how do you feel we can reconcile those issues in a culture that by no means holds men accountable for their sexual pervasiveness. Okay. Well, it's, it's always an interesting question. What happens first? Does the law change and the law change the culture, or does the culture change and then it uh, uh, enables a change in law? Uh, I think we have to start where we can. Uh, I think that we need a broad-based approach. I don't think there's any one certain, uh, one single answer uh, to that, uh, but I believe that there are uh, movements around the country that are uh, increasingly whoop, uh, addressing this hypersexualization.
Um, my question actually ties in with his question. Um, you made a good statement about the um, higher they are, the harder they fall. And I was thinking of Elliot Spitzer as a classic mm -hmm. example of that. And I was wondering what, um, in terms of, you know, people talked about decriminalizing prostitution, but how that would affect the Johns, you know, because I was thinking, it is a matter of stigmatizing them. I think one idea, and I don't know if you are, um, have had any involvement in this in terms at the um, federal level, um, in terms of legislation, but printing the names of the Johns in mm -hmm. newspapers. Mm -hmm. You know, basically, you know, when someone's arrested for something, you know, to get their name out in the paper. I don't even know if there's anything like that, you know, in different states right now. I'm not sure. I was just wondering if yeah. you know about that. Yeah, it, it's a, a type of effort to shame men. Uh, make them afraid of having their names in the paper. I, I'm not opposed to to that. Most newspapers have a policy of saying that they don't print uh, anyone who's been arrested for a misdemeanor, and soliciting sex is often a misdemeanor. So they can sort of hold that as a, 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 a that they're not just not printing the John's names, but they're not printing anybody's name uh, convicted of a misdemeanor. But I have to say, if these guys are committing crimes in which they're hurting people, they need to be arrested and held accountable. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't want just their names to be in the paper. I want it to be serious.